has had a, a um, challenge, so we will go ahead without interpretation. Nevertheless, I'm very excited to introduce you to our amazing speakers today. So we have three of our speakers today. We have Serene, who is the Plastics Policy Coordinator for Gaia Global. Um, Serene joined Gaia in 2018 as a consultant to work on the UN Environmental Assembly and the Basel Convention before integrating into the team in 2022. Previously, she investigated political conflict and human rights violations in the Middle East and North Africa with the international crisis group Amnesty International. She holds a master's degree from the University of Cambridge and the School of Oriental and African Studies and is based in Berkeley, California. It's great to have you with us, Serene. Thank you for joining us. Um, next up, uh, we have Waymi, who um, is our Gaia Africa Clean Energy Campaigner. Uh, Waymi has a background in environmental quality management and microbiology. Prior to his role, he supported the, the development of a WASH master plan in the Delta State in Nigeria as the project manager and program coordinator of Green Knowledge Foundation. Wemi joined the Gaia team in May 2022 and is based in Wari, Nigeria. Glad you're here as well, Wemi. Wemi is my ogre, for those of you who are unfamiliar with him. Um, then we have Farima, who is also with us today. Um, Farima is going to talk us through some of the solutions of the work itself. So Farima is the founder of Adansonia.green and is also the Gaia Africa Organics Program Consultant. Farima likes to see herself as an environmental hummingbird. As an industrial engineer, she moved to Senegal three years ago to work in the environmental field. She has come a long way since then and has very, been very involved in Zero Waste Senegal and has res resumed studies in environmental science. She now works for Adansonia Green Association, a fund a association that she created with the vision of entrepreneurship to be a solution for the environment, and that companies in Senegal can be part of developing a sustainable uh, green way forward. Uh, part of the organization's mission is to tackle reuse and organic waste management. So with that, it's my idea. Uh, great pleasure to welcome you all and our fantastic speakers um, here with us today. And with that, I'd like to go straight into it. So, um, Serene, I'd love to pass it on to you. Thank you, Niva, and thanks, colleagues. Um, so I'm going to speak to you today about circularity or the circular economy in relation to plastics. And um, these are some of the questions that I'll be um, that I'll be touching on today. So first of all, what is circularity or the circular economy? Is it the same as recycling? You know, um, is it always good for the environment? Um, when it happens at uh, uh, across um, national borders, when plastic is traded globally, um, for whose profit is that really done and, and at whose expense as well? Uh, then I'll go into um, uh, some of the challenges with plastic recycling and thinking about what future it might have, especially in the context right now of, of the new global plastics treaty that's being negotiated with the next session coming up very soon in Kenya. And finally, um, safeguards that may be needed for the rights of workers who both collect and, and sort and, and recycle these wastes. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, first of all, a little definition here of circularity um, as we envision it, but not necessarily in the way that I am going to present it in this, in this um, presentation. So uh, our vision for, for circularity is not specific to plastics. That's the first important thing to note. But it's about how we deal with materials in our economies in a way that is restorative and re regenerative. Um, uh, and primarily through reuse first, repair second, and recycling as a last resort, and only when it is safe. Uh, as I will explain later, circularity excludes processes that destroy materials such as toxic recycling, as well as burning plastic waste. 
Um, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, basically, um, a more simple uh, definition of circularity is basically conserving materials, right? So whatever way we deal with materials that avoids loss uh, and that uh, involves uh, some reuse of these materials, whether by reusing products or, or otherwise. So as I just mentioned a bit earlier, recycling is actually the least effective way to achieve circularity. Because basically any process, any industrial process, whether it's washing your reusable products, whether it's repair, um, you know, getting spare parts done, uh, transportation or recycling uh, involves some level of pollution. And out of these processes, recycling is the one that involves the most pollution because it requires new materials to be injected in. It requires energy for the processing. So for plastic, that might be um, sorting, washing, uh, uh, heating it up for melting and extrusion. And that means more pollution. And why do I mention microplastics here? Well, um, as our colleagues have seen who work uh, near uh, plastic recycling facilities, uh, for example, microplastic emissions are a big issue, whether it is um, in the wastewater or really even in the air uh, during the shredding operations, especially, right? Now, coming back to circularity, um, it, as, a, as we started to, to touch on in the last slide, it actually excludes processes that destroy materials, right? So uh, whenever you hear about incineration, uh, uh, co-incineration in, co in cement kilns and plastic to fuel, that's not circular because it destroys materials, right? And the point of circularity is to conserve materials. And the same can be said about toxic recycling, right? Because once you recycle a plastic waste into a product that is too toxic to be used, you're effectively destroying that product's value for the economy to be used safely. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, this is uh, a little bit of an adapted version of our zero waste hierarchy that you may be uh, familiar with, but uh, really thinking about plastics. So there again, obviously the power of the zero waste hierarchy, unlike the conventional one, is it really focuses on the up, upstream part and really emphasizes the importance of rethinking and redesign for, re, for reduction, which is the first step as the best way to, uh, to, to conserve materials is to, to use as little as we need for, uh, for a, uh, an economy that affords well-being for all. And then the next step, as we mentioned, is reuse and repair, because that doesn't involve any, for example, heating of plastics and all the pollution that goes with that as well, because when you heat plastics, you have uh, volatile organic contents, basically fancy word for all these smells that you uh, may have noticed if you've ever been around um, uh, melting plastics. And these are a big threat to health, among other things. And also safe recycling. So that means when we can recycle in a way that is safe for workers and safe for um, people who are going to be using those recycled products. So no toxics there, whether it's um, children's toys or food contact materials or really any application. And then what is not circular, as we just mentioned before, is toxic recycling, chemical recycling as well, because those me methods, whether using solvents or heat, uh, are actually very inefficient. So they destroy more material than they save in the process. Uh, and obviously all of the disposal methods of which the most unacceptable include incineration and open burn, obviously. Next slide, please. So the next question, now that we've touched on what is circularity, so circularity is conserving materials. It is not destroying materials in the economy, right? Is it good for the environment, right? When when I I when I um, implement reuse, is it good for the environment overall? And the answer is a little bit surprising, because actually uh, circularity is only good because we, as we said before, when we reprocess materials, even when we wash our reusable containers, there's always some impact. So these, it's only good overall when these impacts are compensated by the fact that we're producing less virgin material, right? So 
that's not the case when your operation that is circular is validating increasing plastic production. So an example of that is if, um, for example, Coca-Cola says, oh, we're using some recycled content, but actually most of their packaging operations rely on new plastic packaging. And so really these recycling operations are just validating, are just greenwashing a broader operation that is a reliant that is founded on the use of virgin material. So that's not good for the environment. And same thing for reuse. You may have seen uh, uh, you know, some uh, supermarket chains or some big brands uh, uh, have a little pilot reuse project uh, without ever intending to shift their whole production to reuse. So here again, the reuse is kind of greenwashing and validating all the use of, of new material on a large scale. And same thing in that case, that kind of circularity is not good for production because there's no law of physics or engineering or other that guarantees that when I reuse something or when I recycle something, automatically the refinery is going to produce less uh, fossil fuel. Uh, the, the the plastic plant is going to produce less plastic. There's no automatic link there. Okay, That link has to be done through policy, which is why uh, in the plastic treaty, we really want reducing production to be uh, to be uh, the priority. And only when that's in place, can we have operations like reuse, like repair, like recycling, truly be uh, not only circular, but good for the environment. And uh, so there's the, the side of, you know, uh, binding obligations, binding requirements on governments to produce less plastics, but there's also the economic side, right? So right now, uh, we have government subsidies that are making plastics artificially plentiful and cheap. So it's very hard for recycled plastics, for example, to compete. Uh, it's We also have product design and material design decisions that make safe recycling either impossible because there's toxics there or unsafe um, or too expensive because we have multi-material products, for example, your Tetra Pak, right, with the cardboard and the plastic lining that are so expensive to separate in order to recycle that recycling is not actually going to happen realistically. So as long as we have these production levels that are really high because of the subsidies and also because there's no regulation, as long as we have toxic recycling and bad design that makes recycling expensive as well, Recycling, even if it could be safe, it will never uh, displace new material production. Next slide, please. So a few words about recycling. You know, I think we, um, we've we exposed the challenges in terms of toxics and in terms of even um, uh, competition with virgin plastic in terms of price. Uh, but it's worth recognizing uh, that it, what it really does in the system, it's it delays disposal, right? right? So you have a material that's new, it gets used in a product in one loop, maybe a second loop, maybe a third loop, but eventually it's going to go to disposal. Eventually that material will be no longer usable because through each recycling loop with the heating and cooling, uh, the polymer quality gets degraded until the point where it is no longer usable. So it, it delays disposal and, and that has benefits worth recognizing, right? For communities living near incinerators, near landfills, uh, slowing down the process by which plastic ends up in these facilities is a real benefit, but it's a short-term benefit. In the long term, it's not gonna reduce the overall amount of plastic that goes to disposal. And when our disposal operations are toxic, involving burning, that doesn't reduce the overall burden from those plastics that will end up or may end up uh, releasing carbon and toxic pollution when they burn. Um, and finally, uh, most plastic recycling doesn't close the loop. So even pet bottles, uh, pet bottles are the poster child of recycling. When they're collected um, for recycling, they most of the time get recycled into materials that will not complete the second loop, right? So we have one loop and then we're going to uh, their final use and then it will go to disposal. So, um, so even today, the best kind of plastic recycling we have is not really circular if we look at the long term. Uh, next slide, please. 
And maybe a final note uh, on, on safe recycling. We really need chemicals transparency and bans on chemicals of concern to guarantee the opportunity, the possibility of safe recycling. Uh, and that is one of the things, again, that Gaia is fighting for in the new plastics treaty. And until we have that guaranteed, it will be really hard to have applications for plastics that are safe in the economy. So I'll stop there. There's a couple more questions I wanted. Sorry, I'm getting a little, a little bit of interference here. I'll stop here. There's a couple of questions I didn't have time to address, but I'll be happy to cover these in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Serena. Thank you. Amazing presentation. Um, and if anyone has any questions for Serene, please feel free to add them to the chat um, and we will get to them after we're done with the round of presentations. Um, with that, I would like to now hand over to Waimi, who is the Africa Clean Energy Campaigner. Waimi, over to you. Thanks, Nivan. Um, Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'm Wayne Yokoti, like Niven um, introduced earlier on, the Clean Energy Campaigner for the Guy Africa team. Um, so generally, I think um, Sibyl has said a lot already, um, but I'll just try to continue from there. Um, um, we all know that um, the global plastic um, issue or plastic pollution issue is overwhelming to everyone and has been an issue. And um, as a result of the outcry from CSOs like Gaia uh, some years ago, um, then um, the industry has started seeing um, the, 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 the effects of their work on the environment, like producing a lot of single-use plastic. And um, in, in trying to show that they're environmentally friendly or trying to find quick fixes, they have started promoting um, some solutions that we call four solutions that are not um, eco-friendly or have um, a public health effect and, um, to, to people and to the environment. And so we'll be talking about these four solutions. And um, so basically, please, the next slide, please. So, and these solutions um, sustain um, the myth that plastic pollution is primarily a waste management issue, emphasizing technological fixes such as incineration, chemical recycling, plastic credits, bio-based plastics, um, perpetuating the plastic production cycle and exacerbating um, climate and waste crisis. So I've tried um, for the sake of um, these um, meetings or discussion and try to categorize um, four solutions into two major categories. One, unsustainable waste management methods, such as incineration that's, um, or four solutions that burn waste, chemical recycling and the likes. And then we also have misleading market-based approaches and greenwashing. However, both of them are all greenwashing though, but um, such as plastic credits and bio-based um, plastics. Um, so basically these are the two major um, categories of four solutions um, um, as to progress in this discussion. The next slide, please. Next. Next. So um, the first four solution I'll be speaking about is um, waste to energy incinerators. Please go back a bit. One step back. Okay. Um, the first um, four solution I'll be speaking about is waste to energy. And um, basically, yeah, so when we speak about waste to energy, there are two types of waste to energy. And these are facilities that process um, waste into discards. Um, the first, we have the biological waste to energy uh, um, facilities. And next, next slide, just tap it a bit. Um, then we also have the thermal waste to energy facilities. For the sake of um, this presentation and what we do and what we know as Gaia, um, but we have no issues with uh, biological waste to energy, energy facilities, such as um, biogas or biodigesters. But um, the, when we speak majorly in Gaia about waste to energy incineration, um, incinerators, we are talking about thermal waste to energy facilities. And the next slide, please. Next, okay, yeah. And so, um, like I said earlier, on the process waste into um, energy, and this energy could be in the form of heat 
or electricity. And like we all know in Africa, I believe Africa actually has been susceptible to some of this um, very good business proposal showing that we have a waste management problem on one hand, and we have lack of access to electricity or energy on the other hand. And then there's a promise of a facility that is going to take away or going to handle these problems. It's going to burn your waste and going to provide electricity for you or provide heat for you. And so, so most of our governments or our people um, believe that this is a green or um, eco-friendly um, facility. However, uh, we know that all that glitters is not gold. And so, they um, emit a noxious cocktail of substances into the environment, um, such as um, um, heavy metals, persistent organic pollutants, such as dioxins and furan, some of the most um, toxic um, substances ever uh, in our environment. Uh, we also have um, heavy metals like lead, mercury, and this, uh, we call them persistent organic or inorganic pollutants because they, they, they stay in our environment and move from plants to animals, from prey, to predator like that. And so um, also they emit um, greenhouse gases such as um, carbon dioxide. And um, like we all know in um, the, the, the Paris Agreement, uh, we promised to start phasing down um, coal powered plants because of the emissions they produce. And yet um, um, incinerators emit more CO2 compared to um, coal powered plants. And yet these are, pro are, are being um, um, proposed as eco-friendly facilities. As I said earlier on, they emit a lot of substances into the environment that has that pose a public health risk. And it also has a financial impact. They are very, very expensive. Incinerators are very, very expensive to, to build, very expensive to maintain, very expensive to, to keep up. In short, we have the, the records of some communities or cities that have gone bankrupt trying to um, support an incinerator or trying to keep an incinerator running. We're also we're not even going to talk about the locking effect that uh, makes um, cities that put cities under pressure to keep producing more waste. In short, cities are giving targets to produce more waste. Our colleagues from Zimbabwe could uh, testify to that. Um, there's a proposal in Harare where um, the city has promised to produce a certain amount of waste, and in that deal, that city is going to pay a fine if they are not able to meet their waste targets. So one common thing about these four solutions is that they promote the production of more waste. They never speak about reducing waste like plastic or single-use plastic. They're just calling for the production of more waste. And it also has some social impact as well for incinerators. Um, um, incinerators have been found to be um, cited in areas of color in the US. Eight out of ten incinerators have been found to be built in areas of color or people um, or where you have poor people. Um, the, by the quote in the, uh, our current um, president in Nigeria has a quote which says, um, "Let the poor breathe. Don't suffocate them. We owe them that responsibility. They are they already have enough problem by being poor, and then you are bringing a facility that is even going to choke them. Um, so I think that is not something we want to promote. And like I said earlier on, incinerators." Um, competes and undermines with um, systems like the zero waste systems or recycling, things that have already been put in place to find ways um, for a secular economy. An incinerator just comes and burns everything away and puts every effort we have made for a zero waste economy or a zero waste system or a secular economy to waste. Um, the next slide, please. Um, like I said, um, this picture also shows um, the um, emissions from, zero, from uh, uh, incinerators. And sometimes some of these incinerators say they are state of the art. And um, we're going to we have air monitoring systems, state of the art air monitoring systems. However, um, I, I, I don't know. Maybe we have some other consultants here. I don't know of any system that is able to monitor nanoparticles. Incinerators also emit very toxic nanoparticles as well. Um, the next slide, please. Um, similar to incinerators, we have um, cement kilns, and this is called co-incineration, where cement kilns need energy and they burn waste. Um, they burn what we call RDFs, refuse derived fuel, so they, um, to produce energy. So co-incineration is the burning of waste, um, generally in the form of refuse derived fuel, alongside um, other fossil fuels in cement kilns or in other traditional um, incinerators. So this is, like I said, just similar to um, 
incinerators because it has to do with burning of waste. And you have plastic, and just like Siren mentioned earlier, um, the burning of waste, burning of plastic emits volatile organic um, compounds and many other um, um, toxic um, substances. But she mentioned that, and I just went to reiterate that as well. And so cement kilns, the same, just similar to burning of waste, and it's not something we want to promote. However, the cement industry promotes this as a green way of doing their business. Next slide, please. Yeah, um, thanks, Siri. Um, so also, um, we also have um, chemical recycling, which actually um, we can define chemical recycling um, uh, as a, uh, is chemical recycling of plastic is based on using chemical and thermal processes and techniques to break down and separate polymers to a level where they can be used again as monomers, poly polymers, or chemical feedstock in the production of new polymers. So in theory, actually, um, chemical recycling um, um, claims to be able to bring um, wasted waste plastic back to virgin materials and it can be used for whatever. We all know that even the conventional recycling, um, you cannot recycle most plastic more than, let's say, 10, 15 times, and I'm just being generous. And so chemical recycling offers to bring this plastic back to their states. However, this is an unproven technology. This is a technology that has failed and it is, pro it is being promoted as a new technology, but that's a lie. Chemical recycling has been on for, for ages and it has been a waste of money, especially in the developed world. It has been a waste of money. It has never been commercial and yet it is still being promoted as a solution. It's a farce and it should not be promoted. And it has to do with combustion of this waste. And so we know that combustion emits toxic substances into the environment as well. So chemical recycling is just greenwashing for burning of plastic. The next slide, please. Then plastic to fail, um, some of us must have fallen into the temptation of supporting um, um, initiatives like this. Um, turning plastics to fuel. However, it's not um, it's not a, a good solution. And just like I said, um, to to uh, to uh, like I've been saying earlier, um, false solutions always promote the, 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 the they never speak about reducing waste. It always speaks about um, more waste. It's like a business that wants more waste and. Yeah, so that's something you get to find out about most of these four solutions. So it's a subject to climate, um, climate change because of the emissions that are, that are things that are emitted or greenhouse gases that are emitted from um, the production of this fuel from plastic. Finally, the, pla the, the fuel is not clean. Um, it's also wasted billion, billions of dollars, just like chemical recycling, because it's expensive to, to produce and yet it is not commercial and it is toxic to the environment because of the byproducts that are emitted into the environment. And like I said, it perpetuates the overproduction of plastic. Next slide, please. So bio-based plastic um, also, um, this is another false solution and um, that, that is being pro um, promoted. And bio-based plastics are partly or entirely made from biological feedstocks such as sugar cane, corn, potato starch. Most bio-based plastic also contain fossil fuel materials. So, like I said, if another fast is claimed to be bio-based, and yet some in some cases you have up to seventy-five percent being fossil fuel based. So I don't know how that is bio-based actually. And, act and we are also speak, remember that um, SDG2 goal, the sustainable development goal speaks about ending hunger, zero hunger. We're talking about finding arable lands to farm and yet some people are trying to get land to farm plastic. So I begin to wonder how addicted we are to plastic. And since it's most of them are associated with fossil fuel based, um, fossil fuels, we all know the environmental impact of fossil fuel. And it also takes up to one year to degrade per item unless supported by a nearby industrial composting facility. That's for even the pure bio-based plastic. Next slide, please. Then we also have downcycling, which, um, so this is these are um, solutions that claim to um, convert plastic to build, use plastic to build roads, to make brick. Um, we all know that plastic is hazardous 
And so the hazardous chemicals from plastic always leach into the environment. This promotes the production of more plastic, plastic and plastic waste as well. Then it all results in a lot of microplastic, uh, which is um, which, which can leach or which can break down from the roads or from the brick into the environment, into the soil or the water or the air. And so this is not what we want to promote because it also um, promotes the production of more plastic. And um, next slide, please. Then plastic neutrality. Um, so plastic neutrality or plastic credits, um, these schemes detract detractors from efforts to reduce plastic pollution um, in several ways, such as because plastic offsetting allows plastic pollution to continue in one location as long as it offsets, um, it's offsets, um, um, it's offsets in another place. For example, a company in the US can be paying for um, plastic reduction efforts, maybe in Africa where there's cheap labor, and then they claim to have reduced plastic. And let's say they have done, so, and they are, remember that there are different um, type of plastics, a different type of plastic. So plastic neutrality does not encourage this. And personally, um, for the sake of time, I would have spent more time on plastic neutrality. I feel like this, this systematically, this is one of the most um, powerful four solutions because under plastic neutrality, plastic neutrality can actually fund the other four solutions I just spoke about right now. So I think um, this should, we should, for those of us, especially those of us going for the INCs, we need to ensure that um, we, we, we look out for these four solutions not being promoted in any discussion because this has a very big, huge potential to actually support other four solutions. The next slide, please. So um, Serene, I think um, Serene has all, already covered a lot around um, zero waste. And uh, so we need to start supporting um, real solutions and not false solutions that um, pollute our environment and the, and also call for the production of more plastic. We need to support real solutions such as the zero waste concepts and promote, and we need to really stand for the reduction of the production of plastic, especially single-use plastic. And then we need to um, call for, find ways to segregate our waste. And uh, we also need to encourage alternative service delivery models and then support recycling and avoid these false solutions. And in conclusion, I'd like to say that we cannot burn our way out of the plastic crisis. We cannot buy our way out of the plastic crisis by supporting false solutions like plastic credits. And we also need to realize that recycling is not the solution. It is a solution, part of, which is part of the zero waste hierarchy. Um, but we need to keep, um, uh, we need to push, put our energy in reducing plastic production. That's one of the things, and we also need to realize that um, the global plastic or the INCs is a very good opportunity for us to um, promote or discuss these issues and find. Um, so, in the spirit of unity, we have the power to rewrite the narrative of plastic pollution to transform our world from one of waste to one of sustainability. Let's seize this opportunity, especially using the Global Plastic Treaty as a tool. Um, to champion a zero waste concept and together create a planet where plastic pollution becomes a relic of the past and the zero waste future we dream of becomes a tangible reality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amy. Thank you very much for sharing that incredible presentation with us. Um, and thank you everyone already for putting in so many questions in the chat. So we will get to some of the questions in the chat shortly after we have a presentation from um, our environmental hummingbird who is up next so Farima over to you. Hello everyone um, it's me again uh, next slide I think you already know me um, so today I'm here to talk about um, reuse uh, and refill uh, and I will focus on packaging so I'm very impressed on uh, the work that Wayne is doing because he's going to people and saying to people, stop doing that. It's not good and it's very difficult. And I went to the easiest part where I'm like, here is the solution. So here I will, so today I will tell you about the solution for zero waste. So I will uh, be answering the question of what is reuse and refill? <laughs> when is it effective? 
uh, how can we make it a stronger part of a zero waste system uh, and how we can integrate it in global plastic treaty with the enablers and the barriers to adapt reuse solution. Next, please. So, um, reuse solution, Where, why do we want to go to reuse solution? So first, the reuse uh, project that I'm presenting now, it's a break free from plastic work that have started after the regional meeting this year. And we have started, uh, we have decided that we want to focus more on reuse now because we spend a lot of time going to people and telling them that they have to reduce their plastic, they have to reduce um, the consumption of plastic and we spend a lot of time raising awareness um, uh, to people saying that it's not good for the environment. And now that people are listening, we now need to go and to go further to a solution. And the solution to all the issue that we see for zero waste uh, in packaging is through, um, is through uh, reusing. So why do we reuse? We reuse to reduce the production. We reuse because we want a scale and a just reuse system. And we also reuse from um, our history, our tra tradition, especially in Africa, <laughs> where reuse has been used all over by uh, our ancestor. And we want to keep this tradition and to scale up the, the system and continue using um, uh, reusing as our ancestors were doing to protect the environment. Next, please. So the issue when we talk about reuse, and um, I will not start this exercise now, but usually when you think about reuse and you ask for the definition of reuse, uh, I don't know how many people we are here. Uh, we are, I don't know, maybe 20 people, 30 people, and we will have like 15 different definitions. And it's a very difficult exercise to find a proper, common definition of reuse. And for us, it is the beginning of everything. We need to have a common definition for reuse. If we don't have a common definition for reuse, as Sirin just said before, some some companies or uh, some, um, some organization can just take the reuse concept and just use it for full solution and call it reuse. If we don't have a specific reuse terminology, it will be very difficult to implement it and it will be very difficult also to measure uh, if what we are doing is going through the right way for zero waste or if it's just the name that you're using reuse and that is not, um, it's not good for the environment. So for us, <clears throat> when we will talk about reuse in the Global Plastic Treaty, we really want to have definition of reuse system, reuse, refill, repair, repurpose. And even some people are until now um, uh, thinking of recycling when we think of reuse. And we really want to show that it's different things. And we want to be sure that when we talk about reuse, we talk about shifting of responsibility. So we don't want the responsibility to be on the, on the consumer because uh, it will always be difficult for the consumer to be the one in charge of thinking that, oh, I have this, um, I have this uh, reusable but uh, refillable bottle, and I have to do all the effort to make sure that the bottle is refilled again. We have to shift the responsibility, responsibility to government and corporate who have to pay for the system and ensure that the the community have clear input into decision decision making and local system. <laughs> we have to take off the responsibility to in the, uh, of the individual and put in the, put it on the system for all the washing, the transportation, the provision, the everything that is linked to this reuse. We have to take the the responsibility of the indi individual, and we have to make sure that whatever we are doing in reuse is toxic free. This is very important for us. Next slide, please. <coughs> Sorry. So um, this is an example, a picture of a shop that is like uh, 10 minutes away from my house. And uh, it's nice because we see that we are already having some um, 
some system that are being in place in Africa. And for us, what is the real system for packaging? It's a comprehensive system for the multiple rotation of specifically designed with usable packaging with remains with the ownership of the system and not the ownership of the, of the individual and it's loaned to the consumer. Uh, we have a very nice publication, uh, I share the link later, uh, on making reuse a reality. And if you want to learn more about reuse, you can go and, um, and see that, um, that, uh, that publication. And for us, it's important that whatever we do, we also have some innovation based on traditional and cultural practices, especially in Africa. Next slide, please. So reuse for us is essential, but it's not a magical one. First, reuse is not a quick fix. To be able to do reuse, you ha we will have to do it for a long run. So this is not something that will just happen tomorrow out of nothing. We have to put some effort in it. And as, as I said in the first slide, we want reuse because we want to reduce production to prioritize reuse and we don't want recycle and we also want a just transition. So reuse is essential for the zero waste journey, as I said, and it's going toward um, uh, uh, avoiding avoiding full solution as well. It's also reduction re reducing the production and the consumption, and zero waste and reuse are connected uh, uh, in system change. But we have to be aware of the sustainability break-even point. If you have um, a refillable bottle and you use it only once and you break it all the time, uh, it doesn't work. It, it's not um, it's not a good reuse system. So we have to make sure that when we define our reuse system, we make sure that we use um, the, the packaging a certain amount of time to be sure that it's better, it's best for the environment than if we had used another, um, another type of system. And we also have to be aware of the contamination, as I said before, the toxicity. Uh, if I take a plastic bottle that was meant to be used once uh, for water and I reuse it, um, the, the toxicity is not, um, we, we know that the toxicity is not good, but we want to make sure that whatever system we are using, we don't think of the toxicity, toxicity and the reuse system has been implemented to be sure that the no toxic will come out of it when we reuse it again. And also we, we have to be aware of the contamination for the cleanliness because we always have to clean the product and make sure that the product is, uh, is clean when it goes back to the consumer. Uh, next slide, please. So, in um, the report, Making Reuse a Reality, from um, page 35, we have uh, some very interesting uh, information about um, the key barriers and the enablers for reuse system for packaging. And this um, information comes from um, different uh, stakeholders, from businesses to consumer to policy and multinational perspective. They went to all these material supplier informal uh, waste sector, logistic, everyone. And uh, what we see is that um, there are, the different barriers are all located in different sectors. It's not only in one place. Uh, and because we are in a global plastic treaty um, webinar, the lack of government vision and direction for reuse is something that came um, quite often because right now we have a linear approach of policy and we foc government is focus focusing a lot on recycling for policy and investment. And there, as um, Wayne we said, they go through incineration for energy. And then when you start this, um, this loop, you can just not go out of the loop because you have to keep having ways to be able to, um, to feed the machine. So uh, it's a major issue. And another issue is for businesses who say that uh, for them it's difficult uh, to go to reuse uh, because of the cost financing and infrastructure changes. So it's very important that we tackle the government law and vision and everything that is into the infrastructure, the financing and the cost. 
Next slide, please. The enablers in reuse system for packaging, we're gonna, I, I will focus on incorporating the full cost of single use packaging, including waste and environmental aspects. Because right now, uh, um, having a single use seems cheaper for the consumer. So of course, if it seems cheaper, they will always go to, to, to that um, solution. And also it seems more convenient for them because they just use it and they put it in the in the bin. So another thing is also the, um, the importance of reuse system being introduced as a full replacement of single use and not to run them alongside whenever it's possible. Uh, what is important also um, for for reuse system to be enabled is a clear and consistent reuse system policy flame framework and reuse standards, as I said before. Also, investment and government in waste management solution. Um, what came also was the tax incentive um, with single use uh, and and the disincentive with single use ban. Uh, they also talk a lot about extended producer responsibility for all the company to be responsible of the, of the waste that they are creating. And uh, the two last is the partnership between the different sectors because we see that uh, we see that um, uh, to be to be able to enable a reuse system, we have to tap into different kind of um, kind of um, kind of uh, issue and uh, standardization of uh, reuse system. Next slide, please. So now I will just end up with what we want in Global Plastic Treaty for reuse. So the first thing is that BFFP now, the new headline is to prioritize reuse, as I said before. Um, we don't want a system to rely on recyclable, bio-based, biodegradable and compostable plastic because we don't want the system to use uh, single use anymore. And we me explain that uh, already um, very well. Next slide, please. So what we want in the Global Plastic Treaty is that uh, we want to, to integrate all these points in the Global Plastic Treaty for reuse to be able to have reuse system in place. First thing, we want to have reuse system in place with a time frame. We want to be sure that uh, we have a time frame and we don't just say we want reuse. It has to be in a two years, um, two years um, deadline. Uh, it's an urgent matter and it cannot be something that will happen in fifteen year, in fifty years. Um, the Global Plastic Treaty must also also prioritize reduction and reuse of recycling, as I said before. <laughs> We need to change the system and not only the products. It's very important for us. Another thing is that we need some target and baseline uh, assessment along with urgent timeline for the reduction, uh, reuse and repair for plastic products. And the targets should be overall sector specific and not based on the material um, of uh, what is, is being used and we want to ban completely single-use plastic. Uh, as I said, it's very important for us to have the definition uh, of reuse uh, and that it's very specific and have some very reuse-specific terminology to be able to, um, to have um, consistent data and performance of the system that we are going to put in place. Uh, and um, all reuse system must enable just transi the transition for us. We have to, um, we have to, <laughs> okay, we have to, um, to uh, concentrate on traditional knowledge, waste pickers and vulnerable communities. And last, national plants must include essential elements of effective reuse system. So uh, I think we will share the um, next slide. We will share the, the document with you. I just put some, um, some additional resource on reuse if you want to read about them. And just tell you that we, have, we are launching 
uh, micro site on reuse early November, and we are also doing a online launch for reuse revolution the FFP group in Africa on November six uh, at twelve p.m. GMT. You will receive the information on uh, on the Gaia website. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much for listening to me, and uh, and uh, I hope that we will go uh, further with this discussion on reuse uh, together. Fantastic! Thank you so much, Farima, um, for sharing that presentation with us and uh, ending off on a little bit more of a positive note. It's the solution side of things. Um, we are running a little bit over time, so um, for those of you that can stay on a little bit longer, we may go five minutes or so into the hour to take up some of the questions. We have quite a few questions to go through. And if we aren't able to go through all of them, we will answer them offline and send them to you with the presentation and recording um, of the webinar itself. So just to go into it, um, our first question is from Jacob um, and it is to Serene. Um, it's around the recent study by the Portsmouth University where enzyme eating bacteria are used in breaking down plastic products to allow for them to remain in circularity for longer. There's no mention of how toxic this process is. Um, is this type of recycling acceptable or is this the case where we apply precautionary principle? Over to you, Serene. Thanks, Nivan. And I do think there was an earlier question from Samson, but I'll take this one um, with pleasure. So yes. basically, um, as Wei and me uh, uh, sort of pointed to, the fact that one of the components in your process is based in nature, like an enzyme that comes from a bacteria, tells you nothing, basically nothing, about how good or bad this process is going to be for the environment, right? And I'll give you an example. Um, there are today some plastics that are uh, created that are made from uh, enzymes uh, that come from yeasts that create uh, a specific type of polymer, right? And so it sounds like it might be good, but the reality is for these enzymes, for these yeasts to create that enzyme, they have to be given fossil gas and the process is fed by coal, electricity, uh, coal power. In, in China, for example, uh, the manufacturing of PHB. Um, so, so it's a very dirty and polluting process both in terms of the inputs, the material inputs, and the energy inputs. Um, and then the end product in that case is a plastic that also causes microplastic pollution and all the rest. So coming back to the enzyme-based recycling, first of all, we don't know if it's a viable technology at scale. What happens in a lab is very different than what happens in a real facility that is dealing with waste that has been used by consumers that may be... Um, uh, dirty, that may have additives, etc. And then, as you mentioned in your own question, uh, we have zero data on the overall impacts of that process, both in terms of what materials go in, what energy goes in, and what are the energy sources, and then what comes out. Are there byproducts, right, in this process of breaking down with enzymes? Do we end up with... Um, plastic monomers and oligomers and additives swimming around in a kind of toxic soup and what happens to that, right? So uh, basically you're right. Uh, if they give us no data, those uh, companies should have no access to the market. I don't know if uh, anyone else wanted to add to that, but please jump in if you want to. Hey, perfect. Thank you, Serene. Thank you for the response there. Um, we're going to move on. I'm going to mix it up a little bit so we get a question for each of our speakers. So the next question is from Omar, um, and this is for Waymi. There is burning of um, biogas and sugarcane industries. Does this fall under a full solution? Over to you, Waymi. Yeah, yeah um, thanks, Niven, and thanks, Omar. Um, I think um, the questions it was talking about, is, is it co-incineration? So, and co-incineration actually is, uh, speaks about um, burning a mixed waste. Um, so, was burning a bag, bagas, we are talking about burning a single waste, sugarcane waste. That's a singular waste. So, I would not call it co-incineration. However, we do not support burning waste um, because of the emissions that could come out of it. We are talking about 
greenhouse gases and toxic um, substances. So I think I'll just leave it there before I move forward. Um, Siren, maybe you want to add to that, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, wh whenever whenever we're we're burning, we're using a waste to power a boiler. You know, whether that's in a sugar mill, whether that's in um, you know any industrial process. Um, we're just making that industrial process that is that is polluting uh, rely a little bit on on biomass burning rather than something else. The real solution, long term, we are going to need to switch these industrial processes to renewable energy that is not polluting and that does not emit carbon. Right? When you burn by gas or any kind of carbon rich uh, fuel, you're going to get uh, uh, you're going to get both uh, air pollution and carbon emissions. So. I think it's it's kind of similar to burning uh, waste in in a cement kiln, right? Um, it's not really a solution. It doesn't make it green, uh, but they do it because they don't have to pay for the bagasse, right? It's there. It's a waste they have right there, and so they're powering their mills a little bit for free, but in, in a polluting way. So um, so we don't we don't love that. Great, thank you, Wemi and Serene. Uh, our next question, uh, Farima. This is from Samsung. Um, how or what measure can we use to encourage reusable plastics both at the production and consumption level? So uh, for us, when we uh, talk about reuse, we are not uh, concentrating on the material, but the only thing that we want is that it's toxic free. And for now, what we know about plastic is that it's not toxic free. So um, we will not encourage reusable plastic uh, for now for production and consumption, except if uh, companies can come and show us uh, a reusable plastic that can go uh, um, beyond the sustainable break-even point and that is toxic free. Excellent. Thank you, Farima. Um, we're going on to our next question, and this is from Hamza for Serene. How can the design and manufacturing of plastic products be optimized to make them more recyclable? And thank you, Hamza. So I guess our first point, going back to reuse, because we love reuse, right? The first point of design, it should not be designed for single use that is destined for recycling. It should be designed for reuse and repair and then recycling in last resort. And so the reuse and re design for reuse is 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 its own thing designed for repair you want components that you can easily disassemble so that if one part breaks you can replace that part the recycling bit is you want no toxics in the in the composition and you want transparency for for the operators who are going to consider if they want to buy this this material to know that it's safe you want a simplification of the materials so right now we have uh, so many different types of plastics that it's very hard to make sure that there's actually somewhere to go for those wastes. So we need to focus on fewer polymers that are that we have more evidence that they're safe. Um, and we need to have um, uh, also simplification goes to design, right? We might want to simplify the kinds of colors we use because sometimes that happens with pet plastic, for example. We can't recycle it because no one really wants green flake. Um, people want clear, clear, um, clear pet that so that they can they can apply it, and uh, we want uh, we want design of products that are made from a single material or where the materials are easy to separate. So I was mentioning the Tetra Pak. That's a bad example. Uh, Apple products. That's a bad example. Wherever you're gluing your components together or your different layers together in a way that makes it very hard to separate, that makes it very hard to recycle. Um, when it's easy to separate. Then, um, for example, even with labels, you would use a glue that is water soluble so that when it comes to the time to recycle, you can easily get rid of these labels and recycle with just that material, not get all sorts of contamination from the glue, from the ink on the label and all sorts of stuff that has like cocktail effects and can uh, even create new toxic components in the process. Um, I think that's it in a nutshell. Thanks, Irene. And maybe while we're on that, um, is um, distinguishing or having the similarities of repurposing and redesign to upcycling? This is a question from Stefan. Um, yeah, happy to take that. So I think they're all slightly different. And some of them are like precise terms that might be used in engineering. And some of them are like marketing terms. So we have a little bit of a mix here. So repurpose is when you reuse 
a product for a different application, right? So for example, you, you may have seen when I reuse wooden pallets that are used for transporting um, um, uh, merchandise uh, to make a sofa, to make furniture, right? That's repurposing. So I'm reusing the product for a different function. Um, upcycling is when I'm reusing the material. So I'm recy actually recycling the material for an application that has a higher value in the economy than the original product. So for example, if I am making um, if I'm making a handbag from packaging waste, because handbags have a higher value usually in our economy than packaging, that would be upcycling. But that's not really uh, that's not a rigorous term. That's a marketing term usually um, to you know make those uh, products look attractive. Tells us nothing about whether they're safe. And the up is really like it's really about um, economic value, and 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 that can be hard to really measure because we know there's very few handbags made from <laughs> packaging waste overall in our economy. So whether we're really bringing more value is 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 questionable. Um, and then redesign is when you when you're really um, changing the way the product is um, is manufact is manufactured and its features, and so that can be good. Um, depending on what we're redesigning for. Again, redesigning for reuse, safe reuse, that's great. Redesigning for single use, throw away and maybe recyclable, not great. We can do better. Thank you, Serene. Uh, Farima, did you want to add anything to the response? All good? Great. Um, and then lastly, we have a comment from Raisa uh, and Waymi, maybe if you could react to the comment, which is some organizations are promoting the conversion of plastics into paving stones for roads, but some architects who have used the system say it's not sustainable. So Waymi, I don't know if you have any um, reflections on that comment from Raisa. Yeah, I think the statement um, on its own is, uh, is a welcome idea. Hearing that from engineers saying that's not sustainable um, from the engineering perspective, but also as environmentalists, is not the way to go because it promotes more production of plastic. It's a false solution. And um, scientific research shows that um, river bodies, water bodies close to such um, facilities have a high um, concentration of uh, microplastic. So it's not something we want to promote. Um, thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Amy. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. I'd like to thank our speakers, Farima, Serene, Waimi. Thank you so much for sharing your presentations with us. Thank you all for joining us. Um, in your registration um, for this, you did indicate your email address, so we will be sharing all of the presentations and the recording itself by email. So again, a huge thank you to our speakers um, today, and thank you all, and I hope you all keep up. Cheers, everyone. Thank you, Niven. Thanks, Niven. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank Bye. you guys so much. Cheers, everyone.